3, video 3 debate, the constitutional compromises, the great compromise, the three-fifths compromise, and the ratification compromise. If you can debate, give facts for both sides and see both points of view and be able to agree with both sides in the great compromise or the three-fifths compromise or the ratification compromise, then you are evaluating and you are analyzing. It is also okay if you're just understanding and remembering. You know what the compromise is. You know the result. You know what the compromise is. You know what the result. You know some of the background facts. That's okay as well. You don't always have to be high level and it's okay to be low level. We will continue to build on that knowledge. I'm not going to go over the Articles of Confederation. You can go back to Unit 3, Video 1, but just know that it set up a weak government and we we got rid of it because, well, our government got rid of the weak government because they wanted more power. Imagine that. The government wanted more power. One of the weaknesses was that all states were equal. What's the problem there? Well, little old Rhode Island got a vote to pass laws, and big old Virginia and North Carolina got one vote. It's not really fair because very few people lived in Rhode Island, and a lot of people lived in Virginia. So those few people had a lot of power. We need to find a way to balance that out in our new government. Rhode Island's like, no, 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 I think our plan's fine. Well, so we need a new government, and one side's going to want to change, and one side's going to say, no, 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 let's stay the same. Another problem was two-thirds of the states had to agree. That's just too many states that you need to agree, and this is a divergent nation that believes in different things. And even today, you imagine getting two-thirds of the states to agree on something, considering how different the economies and the populations are. And so two-thirds is, is too much. A majority is what we'll need. So we'll get rid of the Articles of Confederation. We'll set up this secret, illegal, conspiratorial meeting. And James Madison will be the guy with all the ideas. Check out video three or video two, unit three, video two for Madison's beliefs. Also, if you go to Social Studies Guide Social studies games.net. I don't know what social studies guide, but you can find the social studies study guide under unit three, social studies games.net. And in the study guide, you'll see more details that I don't specifically list in the video, but will be on your AP US history test. Ideas of Montesquieu and Rousseau and more details about separation powers and all the specific facts. So check out the study guide, play the games. One of the problems or the issue here is you've got a nation that really isn't a nation. You have to bring them together, but yet the people in the South don't see things the same as the people in the North, and the people in New England don't see the things the same as the South, and neither wants to follow either's rules. No one wants to live in a government. The South doesn't want to live in a government designed by the North, and the North doesn't want a government or economy designed by the people in the South. How do we come up with a constitution that meets both needs and isn't pushing or bullying around each other? A compromise, an agreement or settlement, or an agreement or a settlement of a dispute that is reached by each side making concessions or giving in a little. I know people are like that's elementary. You shouldn't have to repeat that. Yeah, I should. If you are noticing the political activity of the nation at the moment, people need to be reminded what a compromise is, and it is completely acceptable and okay to give in a little. No one gets everything that they want, and if they do get everything that they want, it's awfully bad for everyone else. Let's go through some of these compromises. The first issue we're going to have is a battle between big population states and small population states. In the Articles of Confederation, the small population states had a lot of power to make laws. That doesn't really make sense proportionately. The big population states should have more power so that the individual citizen has an equal amount of power. So, I mean, if we go with, so you say, all right, throw out the Articles of Confederation and just make the government representation, our republic, make it based on population. So the big population states will get a lot of power. Well, the small population states aren't going to want to get along with that. They'll never be able to pass a law. All the laws will favor the big population states, and the small population states are always going to lose. So the small population states are never going to agree to a constitution that strongly favors big population states. And you're probably saying, you know, but you already talked about in the last video, we have republicanism. We have a government where representatives in Congress are based on population. We have it. So they agreed to it. Sort of, kind of, let's go into the details. Everyone's going to get a little in a lot of these compromises. So the great proper compromise is going to be a battle between big population states and small population states. The Articles of Confederation favors the small population states while cheating the big population states. We're going to get rid of the Articles of Confederation, move to a constitution. Now, the constitution does not favor the big population states. It will favor both because it is filled with compromises. How do these compromises work? Well, we're going to get into that. Now, 
the great compromise, one of the debates here is, hey, we should have more power, right? If you have more people in your state, you should have more representatives and be able to make more laws. The argument for from New, New England or from Connecticut and Rhode Island is like, yeah, but you're counting slaves. All right, we'll get to the counting slaves thing here in a second. But ignore the slave part. And there is a point that if there's more people, those people should have more representation, or at least it should be equal. If there are five people in your state, you don't need that many representatives in government. But if you have millions of people in your state, then you should have more representatives. It's just it makes common sense. All right. So if we look at it today, which state gets more representatives in Congress? Is it California or is it Montana? And it's not has nothing to do with geographic size. It's about how many people live in your state. And so most people listening will know, like, yeah, California has more people. That means it will have more representatives in Congress, more people voting yes or voting no. Montana has fewer people. So they'll have fewer representatives voting yes or no. End of the day, California's going to have more power because it has more people. Well, that's not good for the small population states. Remember, we've got to give a little on both sides. Here is going to be the solution in the Great Compromise. The founding fathers realized this. We can't just help out the big population. We've got to give a little too. So here's how it works. They will take Congress, the lawmaking branch of our government, and divide it into two houses. They'll take the legislative branch and decide we're going to create two houses. The Articles of Confederation had just one house. Well, now we're going to have two. It's going to be bicameral. Again, study guide at socialstudiesgames.net. We'll have all these vocabulary words and all the definitions. In the House of Representatives, today there are 435 members, 435 leaders or representatives in a republic. One comes from Montana. I'm showing three. That counts the two senators. And then a bunch from California. Every 700,000 people today, this is today's standards, you will get one representative. Obviously, more people in California, more representatives in the House of Representatives. Fewer people here, fewer people in Montana. So I know you can see three. I'm counting their two senators. So Montana gets one representative because they don't have very many people. And California gets 53 because they have a bunch of people. So it's really equal. 700,000 people here, they get one vote. And for every 700,000 people here, you get one vote. It's proportioned. It's great. It makes a lot of sense. But still, small population states don't like it. I get it. It makes sense. But we do not want to join a country. We don't want to sign a constitution where we will have no power whatsoever. So the founding fathers realized this. How are we going to balance the power? How do we convince these small population states to abandon the Articles of Confederation and to sign a government where they're not going to have much power? Well, we're going to have have to give them some power. They're not going to join a place or a new government that takes away all their power. we got to give them something in return. And that's where the bicameral thing is. This gives too much power to the big population states. So remember, it's bicameral. So in the House of Representatives, based on population, Senate will be every state gets two. Now, when you pass a law, a law has to be passed by the House of Representatives and Senate. So the big population states can go to town in the House of Representatives and vote yes on everything, but they still have to get that law to pass the Senate where the small population states have power. So that's the way we balance the power between big population and small population. It is a compromise. And today we have 100 senators. Every state gets two. Little old Montana, I know Montana's big geographically, but in terms of population, has the equal power to big old California when it comes to the Senate. And these houses are equal. So that is the great compromise. It's fair. It's a great idea. What about the slaves? All right, well, let's get to the slaves. We're not bringing the slaves, unfortunately. As sad as that sounds. All right, power struggle number two, free states versus the slave states. This is the three-fifths compromise. And we alluded to this earlier. You shouldn't be able to count your slaves towards population. Remember, more population means more representatives in government. More representatives in government means more laws that favor that state. So these northern states that don't have a bunch of slaves, don't have large populations, it's not fair to them. And it's also not right morally or ethically to count your slaves. What are you going to do? Count your horses too? Now, I know that sounds very glib to say, to compare human beings and horses but let's get to that. So you shouldn't be allowed to own slaves is the North. And this is not necessarily the Northern point of view to act like this was the general consensus in New England and Northern. And while these states weren't really pro-slavery, they weren't necessarily anti-slavery. They were abolitionists. But to assume that that was the general mindset, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but we'll go in that route because it's much easier. Well, it's my property and the government can't take it away. So that's true. That is also technically true. 
that's why we go to the horse thing of, well, you shouldn't be able to count your horses because horses are property. So if it's property, then they don't count towards population. All right. So you can't have a slave. Well, we can't take my slaves away because they're my property. All right. Well, if they're your property, then they don't count towards population. And the Southern response is, no, I'm going to count the pop as population too. <laughs> so that doesn't make sense. You can't, they can't be property and be a citizen. It's one or the other. If they're property, fine, it's wrong and that's terrible, but you can't count them. If they're not property and they're human beings, then yeah, you can count them, but you should free them and we should free them and it won't count as taking your property away. See how that works? And the South's like, nah, we don't care if it doesn't make any rational or logical sense. And hey, I mean, are you new around here? Have you seen the rational and logical political conversations that have happened in the last, I don't know, ever? Have you tried to explain something to someone and say, well, here's where your argument is rationally and logically wrong. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. And this is a perfect example of, this doesn't make any sense logically for the South other than, yeah, it does, because ba people bend their beliefs to favor themselves. And that's what the South, when the South wanted the slaves to be property, oh, they're property. But when they wanted to count them as human beings, then they counted them as human beings. So if the South has a lot of people, then it means they have a lot of representation in government. And that means more Southern laws and the Southern laws are going to keep slavery legal forever. That's a big problem as we're signing the Constitution. The North does not want to do this because if the South can count all their slaves, then the South always going to have more representation in Congress. And if they always have more representation in Congress, if we try to outlaw slavery, every time that law will go up to vote, the Southern states will have more power and the Southern states will always vote, no, we are not going to outlaw slavery. We got to do something to balance the power out and take some of the slavery power from the South. And the compromise is going to be the three-fifths compromise. But rewinding it a little bit, taking this, well, not rewinding, let's take another step because there's another issue here that we're going to talk about with the three-fifths compromise. It's not completely about slavery. It's also about money and taxes. If your state had fewer people, then you paid less in taxes. And if your state has more people, then your state pays more in taxes. Now it's like, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, they're, they're property now. Uh, so don't count them towards population because we don't want to pay a bunch of money. Shut up, right? <laughs> you can't have it both ways every single way. So if we explain it, let's look at uh, not counting slaves. The, in this example, Virginia has three people. Now we start counting the slaves. Now they have eight. So the population increases. So well, we know what that's going to happen. And then the three-fifths compromise is saying, well, you can only count three out of every five slaves. And so that's going to reduce it down. So from the tax perspective, eight people would have been more in taxes. Okay, so it's not as bad. It's not as good, but it's in between. And then in terms of representation in government, uh, you're not going to get as many, but they still are going to get quite a few representatives in government by counting their slaves. And the North accepts this. The South accepts this. They agree to the Constitution. And we move on. Does not address the problem of slavery being a horrible, horrific, heinous thing. But the North is in no position at the moment to outlaw slavery because they're trying to unite the nation to get moving. I mean, they barely have just won a war. You can make a lot of excuses. That's for another video. Nonetheless, the country agrees on it and does not outlaw slavery at that time. So there's three-fifths compromise. Northern and Southern states compromise by agreeing to count every five slaves as three persons, both for representation and for taxes. You'll hear this often. The government believed that black people were only three-fifths of a human. They're terrible. Okay, so it is right to probably just assume that everyone was racist during this time, and we don't want to dismiss that. But we also have to understand that if everyone was racist, then it was just a different time. Uh, we often look at the past through where we are now, where we see things completely differently. We live lives completely differently, and not... not not to say that their views, their views are wrong. Slavery is wrong. Everything that was wrong, but we have to be able to separate our own views and our own moment in time from what they were doing. But yes, they were all probably racist. But now let's just talk about this idea of the government believed that black people were only three fifths of human. Well, if you choose to believe that, this idea that the three fifths compromise means that they only value three fifths of a human being. Well, the pro slavery, pro as in for slavery Americans, they wanted to count everybody. So then they valued slaves as as a whole person. And the people that did not treat black people as whole people were technically the anti-slavery Americans. They didn't want to count everyone. Now, they didn't want to count everyone because they didn't value the person. They didn't want to count everyone because of government representation. 
It's a little bit more complex than this, but if you choose to believe it, it's fine. Here's another one you can choose to believe. The CARES Act was passed recently. What is the CARES Act? The CARES Act says that for every child you had to get 500 bucks during our COVID recession. Oh, cool. That's, that's awesome. But it's only up to every four children. After the fourth children, the government is not going to send you 500. After your fourth child, the government's not going to send you 500 bucks anymore. It's only up to the fourth one. The government hates fifth children. That's the same logic that you are using. It's a much more complex issue. There's a lot more detail to it than, but whatever. You can believe what you want to believe. We'll get to this in the next video. I'm running long.